but um, we're going to find ourselves beginning at the end of uh, chapter 9, the end of Genesis chapter 9. So if you want to find that, we'll get there. What's that? Oh, did I, did I say Exodus? You'll catch up with yourself. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. That's why Jerry, that's why he has this assigned seat right here. Okay, that's why we have these assigned seats right here, okay? All right, keep me in line. All right, thank you. I don't know where Exodus, I've not been thinking about Exodus or anything today, but okay. All right, all right. Anyway, Genesis, Genesis chapter 9. All right, we're going to go to God in prayer if you would bow your heads with me for a few minutes. Father in heaven, we, we come to you, we bow ourselves before you in this time of prayer, and we call upon your attention uh, to you, for you to bend your ear towards us for a few moments. We uh, think this is such a great time to be able to come together as your people and pray together, many things to pray about. Um, we ask you, Father, to be with us as we go throughout these spiritual exercises today, that they will be beneficial to us and that we will make our remarks and and do all things, Father, in your direction and and, and with with the desire to please you and honor you. And we pray that all that we do and say will be in harmony with your will. Uh, We ask, Father, to uh, continue to be with us and, and keep us in good health. We're thankful, Father, that Things are as well with us as they are, but we are mindful of many who are not doing well right now or they have health concerns in their lives, and we ask you to be with all of them. Um, we will mention many of them during the announcement time, and, but we, we ask, Father, that you would be with all of them collectively. We especially have a great concern right now for, for Ryan Davis and we pray that you would be with him and be with the doctors and, and nurses and the, all the staff who are looking after him and trying to bring some repair to his body. And we pray, Father, that his body will respond to the care that he's getting. Um, Father, we pray that you would bless those who have lost loved ones and um, that you would bless them with, with the, the tenderness that they, that they need from you and from your people. Be with them that there will be some, uh, some comfort given uh, during their time of, of, of grief and heaviness. We pray that you would bless them, Father, with, with just your compassion and your comfort and your peace and care. Father, be with others who are facing um, some difficulties in their lives, different, different kinds and uh, But the stresses that come with that, the frustration that comes with that, we pray, Father, for a path forward for all of them, uh, but not just as it pertains to this life, but a path forward with you that they will lean upon your wisdom and your understanding of things and your will. And we pray that, that your word will be of great use to them and to all of us, Father, as we seek answers to life's difficulties and problems. Be with our country, and we pray about that often because we see our country and the world itself in such turmoil and in such need of you. And this is what happens when men and women dismiss you from their lives and the the effect of that upon the world and upon nations um, and upon so many different levels of relationships. Father, we pray that, that somehow um, <clears throat> you will, in your providence and in your care and in your planning, that you will bring men and women to some kind of recognition um, that, that they need to give attention to you and to your will. Father, we know that a big part of that will be the way that we live our lives before them. We pray that that we will be light to those around us and that we will be faithful to your word and be able to declare your word in an effective way and in an influential way. And when we we fail, 
when we fail in doing that, we pray that you would forgive us and, uh, and teach us in a greater way, uh, teach us more uh, about you and about your will so that we can be more effective in the future. Uh, we thank you for everyone who's here today, uh, here in this room, but in the other uh, classrooms. And we thank you, Father, for everyone, uh, everyone who's here, all the families who are here, those who belong to our church family and they couldn't be with us today because they're traveling or on vacation or for work or because they're ill at home. We pray, Father, for them and that your guidance and your peace will be with all of them. Uh, be with us now, Father, as we talk about your word and what your word is telling us and, and where it's leading us to. Um, help us to be effective in our understanding of it and uh, in the collection of knowledge that we have, uh, that we obtain, that we can add that to our tools uh, for teaching others. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us and was resurrected from the dead. We pray that as he lived and as he walked by faith, so, so we will do the same thing. We pray these things in his wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me for a few minutes. Thank you for making the efforts that uh, you made to be here today. And many of you have prepared food and we really, really do appreciate that. And thank you for your presence here uh, today in this, in this Bible class. Feel free to, to ask a question or make a comment. Um, and if, I'm, if I don't see you, if I'm not attentive to that, then just speak up. It's okay. Um, but whatever you do, do speak up. Okay, I have the advantage of having a microphone, you don't, um, but feel free to speak up um, to make your comment or ask your question if it's helpful uh, in our understanding. Um, again, we are at the end of uh, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9, and um, we, we read there, uh, we're, we're at the end of this situation of um, Noah, they're, they're, they're not on the ark anymore, they've gotten off the ark, the animals uh, have dispersed or in the process of, of dispersing. And, and here we have um, Noah becomes a, a, a farmer and uh, he raises uh, uh, grapes and he gets drunk on the wine and he becomes uncovered um, in his, uh, in his uh, tent and uh, one of his sons, Ham, sees him uncovered. We don't know all of the particulars we can imagine. We uh, have opinions about that. We don't know all of the particulars, but um, somehow uh, Ham saw this. He saw the nakedness of his father in verse 22 and went out and told his brothers who were outside. They did not see. And then we read in verse 23 that Shem and, and Japheth the two brothers, they took a garment, laid it across their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away. They did not see their father's nakedness. That is a, it's a major thing here uh, that, that happened here. Ham saw their father's nakedness. Shem and Japheth did not. Verse 24, Noah awoke from his wine, knew what his younger son had done to him. And then there are some pronouncements being made here in verses 25 through 27. So that's where we are. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Okay, so uh, part of this, uh, this pronouncement is, um, uh, this curse is that Canaan, Cain, Canaan would be the servant of his brothers, Shem and Japheth. And he mentions um, <clears throat> Shem first in verse 26, that Canaan would be his servant. And then he moves on to verse 27 <clears throat> to Japheth. May God enlarge Japheth and may he dwell in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his servant. So it is stated three times that Canaan will be a servant to others. And in particular, to his two brothers. Now, this has a generational, it seems to have a generational impact, uh, meaning to all of this. I asked the question last week, why is Canaan cursed um, when Ham was the culprit? Okay, why is that? 
Okay, I, I, you know, the, the answer to that question is not explained here, okay? Canaan um, um, perhaps uh, is mentioned, perhaps is mentioned here um, to alert the Israelites who are the first readers of this, of where the Canaanites came from, okay? Um, so they have that identity here. They're going to encounter the Canaanites uh, very soon. And uh, Abraham is going to encounter them as well. This is where um, they are coming from, from Canaan. And then um, we were already introduced in verse 18 to Canaan. Why? It, it doesn't tell us why. Okay. But perhaps, perhaps um, Canaan is cursed instead of, uh, of Ham, his father, uh, maybe there were some of the same tendencies going on in Canaan, in his thinking, uh, in his life that were true um, in, in Ham and what Noah was seeing in, in Ham. And then, and then thirdly, and I think that this may be um, a very real possibility, is that there had already been a blessing um, issued uh, concerning Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And maybe there was no way for Noah in any way to reverse that. Uh, no way to take back that, that blessing. And so he, there, the curse is given to Canaan, um, Shem, or Ham's uh, uh, son, uh, instead. And uh, perhaps that, that is the case. And, and again, it's a generational thing and uh, doesn't have anything to do with ethnicity, if certainly there, because that suggestion has been made. But they're all the same family, okay? They're all they're all of the same family. There was something. There's a moral component here um, that needs to be considered here. And um, Canaan is um, uh, did something wrong morally. Go ahead, Steve. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Well, it would seem if it is the same thing, it would seem it would be the reverse of that because Canaan is inheriting something. And there's some, there's connection between what Ham did and the curse being pronounced upon Canaan. So uh, why that is, why that is, we can't know specifically, it seems, but Ham did something wrong. My thinking was that maybe it was because the blessing had been given to Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and that that couldn't be reversed in any way. Bill. Yeah. 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 Well, and and yeah, I mean, I mean, okay, okay. Yeah, Mo Moses, Moses is writing from the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Well, 
And so we, we, we just have this curse going on with Canaan. And uh, this is what uh, Noah makes this pronouncement. And uh, this is what, uh, what occurs. It doesn't mean that any of Canaan's um, 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 the generation, the lineage that comes from him uh, cannot be saved and uh, anything like that, that they cannot be of service to God. For example, we, we know that Rahab the harlot is going to come out of this, out of, uh, out of Canaan. And uh, she's going to be someone who makes a choice to serve God. And of course she is saved. Anyone has that opportunity, the Canaanites, anyone has that opportunity to, uh, to deny, to go against the idolatry uh, of their people and to serve God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Not that I know of. Other than the chance of her being good, mm -hmm. that's not super tactical. Yeah. Well, the same word, if I'm not mistaken, go back and look at Genesis chapter uh, 4. The same word is used in regard to um, Cain. Um, and uh, so there was a pronouncement that was made. Of course, it was God who made that decision um, to punish and to, to, to take away the blessing that would be Cain's. Well, Noah is making this pronouncement here. I'm assuming um, that because Moses, or Noah rather, is making this pronouncement that it, it sticks. And when you look at the lineage of Canaan, it looks like that the curse is real and that it follows itself out um, into his lineage. So anyway, look at, um, look at verses 26 and 27, not a lot of time here, but uh, look at the blessing upon Shem and the Hebrew people are going to come from Shem. We know that from the rest of the, the lineage as it plays itself out later on. Um, it is believed also that Armenians, Persians, Assyrians, and Arabians descend from Shem as well. The Hebrew, Chaldee, Assyrian, and Arabic languages are normally referred to as Semitic uh, languages and after, after, um, after Shem. And uh, the, anyway, this prophecy was, had more concern to do with the Hebrew element than any of the others. And then you have the blessing upon Japheth um, God, it says, was going to enlarge. Uh, may God enlarge Japheth and the lands around, it is believed, the Mediterranean, Europe, and a lot of Asia, much of Asia. And that would include, um, if Europe, then also it would include North and South America and Australia uh, would come from, would be populated from, from Japheth. All right. So anyway, there's going to be a close relationship, blessing, very similar blessing given to Japheth and to uh, Shem. In verses 28 and 29, we come to uh, the final uh, things that are said here about Noah. Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And uh, so all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. By the time we get to the Hebrews and the children of Israel, by the time we get to there and the age of Moses and, and all of that, and even the age of Abraham, you're going to see the, the ages of these individuals is going to be cutting down dramatically. Okay, so when the children of Israel read here about Noah being 950 years, Methuselah prior to that, they had to be, like we are, astounded that these people could live um, so long, and no doubt living so long because of God's blessing. Bill. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, if I, if I remember right, I don't, I don't remember, but um, we'll, we'll look at it momentarily, uh, if not today or next week. But uh, Shem, um, his longevity is not going to be anywhere close to, to Noah, and that's his father, okay? So something happens here where the ages of these individuals is cut dramatically, all right? So anyway... Uh, chapter 10, chapter 10. In this chapter, uh, we find a really a fairly straightforward and simple account of the dispersion of the sons of Noah after the flood. Um, Japheth and Ham are mentioned first, their immediate offspring, and then the generations that follow them. And most of the names here appear to be individuals, but they can also include uh, peoples and nations just like the the tribes of the children of Israel, okay? Uh, first of all, they start out as people, as men, and then they come to represent uh, the different uh, tribes. And Shem's generations are going to be mentioned uh, last, so that really because uh, most of the attention of the rest of the Bible is going to be on them, so we can have this unobstructed view of, uh, of their history and the remainder of this book. Now, understand what happens here, just kind of keep this kind of filed away or how this is filed away in your mind as you think about this. The, the dispersion that's described in chapter 10 actually takes place after the confusion of the tongues in chapter 11, okay? Because in chapter 11, we, we, we were introduced to them all being together, okay? And now they're going to, they're going to be dispersed. And so chapter 10 is actually this dispersion and where everybody goes uh, is actually going to follow what happens in, in chapter 11. When I think of this chapter, chapter 10, I'm reminded of uh, Paul in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 24 and 28, when he's talking to the people. And he says this, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Very smart poet there. We are also his offspring. And anyone um, who knows anything today will look at the world and say, we are the offspring of God. Bill. Okay, who's that? Okay, okay, okay. Okay. I see, mm-hmm, okay. Ah, good point, good point. Well, that's great. That's great. Now you'll, you'll see this very, this is easily systematized here. Verse one, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Uh, Moses is saying, all right, here, here's how the nations went here and there and yonder and everywhere. Shem, Ham, and Japheth and sons were born to them after the flood. Okay, so pinpointed there after the flood. Now for a time, the brothers are going to stick together Okay, they're going to stick together when we come to chapter uh, 11 and verse 1, and they're going to have one language, uh, the idea being that they're intending to stay together. Anyway, um, I was kind of uh, thinking about this. Do I want to go through and, and try to say all of these names? And, and uh, that might be a little bit difficult. But verses 2 through 5, um, if I can run from difficulty, I will. Uh, verses 2 through 5, we have the line of Japheth, and as Bill mentioned there, uh, Gomer uh, and a number of others that are mentioned here. Um, 
so much time has passed since these genealogies ha were given, you know, from where we are today in 2022. Um, this is speaking, obviously, futuristic, futuristically after the dispersion of, of chapter 11, verse 1. Um, difficult today because of travel and because people have changed directions and, and where they live and all of that to define precisely where all these various descendants settled geographically. Some of these people um, seemingly no longer exist or at least not where we're able to identify them precisely. Uh, as we know today, people tend to gravitate towards family and where language and culture holds them together. All of that's true, it's true today. It was true uh, back then. But Japheth's line, verse 5, moved to the isles and to the coastlands. Um, then verses 6 through 12, we have the line of Ham. And uh, that's important because we've just been talking about Ham. A great deal uh, is said about him in verse 9, and more is said here. Canaan is mentioned, Canaan, the son of Ham, who will bear the curse. That's mentioned in verses 25 through 27 of chapter 9. Uh, and Canaan is going to be discussed again here in just a little while, and beginning in, in verse 15. Um, one, one of interesting thing here that Moses does as he's writing this is verses 8 and 9, he speaks of Cush, the son of uh, Ham, and he says, Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. Kind of a curious description here. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, you know, like it's said, uh, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, okay? I guess, you know, people knew this saying, okay? Like Nimrod, uh, the mighty hunter before the Lord. I don't know, perhaps the description here notes some kind of uh, civil or political prowess. I, I, I don't know. He's a mighty one, probably the meaning is that he's a hunter, or, or if not a hunter, he's a warrior, a mighty warrior uh, on the earth. The name Nimrod means to rebel, okay, to rebel. And so the meaning here may be that he is, that he is a rebel uh, before God. Bill? Okay. 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 Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, anyway, definitely it says he did these things before the Lord. Twice it says he was a mighty hunter. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. The Lord certainly took notice of him. Um, perhaps as one to be greatly feared by others, certainly not feared by God, but, but uh, the name Nimrod itself means to rebel. The descendants of Ham um, are never known that we can tell, never known to be servants of God. And um, so I don't put them in that category, same category as I would um, the descendants of Shem or of Japheth. Um, the beginning of his kingdom was, look at this, was Bel, Iraq, Akkad, Kana, and the land of Shinar. That's going to come back, okay, again and again when we look at uh, Babylon or Babel, all of that in the land of Shinar and Babylon, you remember, you know your Old Testament history, is going to become Israel's nemesis and eventually terminate Judah as a nation, okay? Um, so Assyria is mentioned in verse 11. Uh, from that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, okay? So Assyria is going to later be known as a very cruel people and infamous for destroying the northern kingdom of Israel, okay? That's going to happen. Nineveh, okay? From the prophet Jonah, Nineveh, the city of greatness is where Jonah went to preach repentance. 
And when he preached repentance, what did the city do? It repented. Okay, it repented of its idolatry and its sin. So that's a great thing. Um, anyway, uh, Noah N Nimrod is is he builds cities for sure. He builds cities. He's not known for building altars. Okay, to to the Lord. Okay, may have built other, other kind of altars. I don't know but he's not known for building altars to the Lord. 13 and 14, uh, that continues. Most of these are to be identified with, with uh, North Africa, I understand, and, and Egypt. Notice in verse 14, the Philistines are mentioned. They are going to be great enemies to Israel at the um, end of the period of the judges and into the monarchy periods of Israel, of Saul, David and Solomon. Verses 15 through 20, again, Canaan is mentioned um, uh, here as he was in verse 6. And um, by the way, this indicates, if this is true, and it is true, Canaanites were not a Semitic people, okay? They didn't come from Shem, okay? They obviously came from, from Ham. And most of the people in the places and the cities that we're reading about here in verses 18 and 19, most of the places and cities uh, in keeping with the curse of, Na of Canaan, they were dispossessed by the Israelites and the cities, their cities were destroyed by the Israelites. So there's gonna be antagonism coming uh, between, the, um, between the, the, the lineage, those coming from the lineage of Canaan and those coming from the lineage of Shem. And these were the sons of Ham, verse 20, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands and in their nations. Now, when we come to verses 21 through 32, which occupies the, the bigger part of this, you have the line of, of, of Shem, okay? Which is clearly where Moses wants our, you know, most of our focus and our attention. And look at a couple of things here, important things. Children were also born to Shem, the father of, of all the children of Eber. And I understand the way to pronounce that is Heber, from which we get the word Hebrew, right? Okay. The father of all the children of Heber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. Okay. So this is the descendants coming from Shem. And look at the names and um, look at how they're mentioned. Notice in verse 21 that Shem, the father of all the children of Heber, and it's going to be a couple of generations later in verse 24 when Heber actually comes on uh, the scene. Um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, thing here. When we come to Heber, verse 25, to Heber were born two sons, okay? It's very interesting in, in the Bible that, that many of these personalities, they have two sons and there's some competition, um, a contrast uh, between them here. And you have these two sons, the name of one was Peleg, uh, for in his days the earth was divided. So that's coming in chapter 11. And then his brother's name was Joktan, okay? Those are easy names to say, right? They're easy uh, to say. Moses is going to do this again, according to brothers, Ishmael and Isaac. You're going to have that going, you know, antagonism between those two brothers. And then also, who's the other? The grand ones, more important ones, Esau and Jacob, okay? You're gonna have them coming up a little bit later on. But look at these two sons here, Peleg, he is clearly the elect one of the two. He is the elect, and from his line is going to come Nahor, and then Terah, and then Abraham, okay? And so we're going to actually focus on Peleg again in chapter 11, verses 10 and following. But Peleg, his name means division, which makes sense, okay? Uh, his name is prophetic of the dispersion that's going to be coming uh, here uh, at, at Babel in, in, in chapter 11. And then the two sons of Heber uh, themselves will be divided. Joktan, which is the non-elect son, 
he is the forefather of the people of Arabia, probably, okay? Forefather of the people of Arabia. So anyway, you're going through and uh, mentioned here, first of all, are the sons of Joktan and their dwelling place was from Mesha as you go toward verse 30, um, Sefer and the mountain of the east. And um, uh, difficult to know exactly where those places are, uh, I'm told, okay? Difficult to know where they are. But when we come to verses 30, 31, 32, these were the sons of Sham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations, just like the other uh, two are mentioned in this same, same way. Um, and the line of Shan is going to pick up again in greater detail in chapter, um, chapter 11 until we get to Abraham, okay? Until we get to Abraham. Anyway, these were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations and their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood, okay? So... Any additions that you would like to make to that? Any questions? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty clear as we read this, isn't it? It's pretty clear that, and, and I, I don't know, I mean, did the, did the Jewish people, did the Hebrews, did they have this understanding? You know, we're going into the land of Canaan and all of that, but those people are our cousins, okay? They're our distant relatives and all of that. Now, God told them to go in and march through, and you take that land. I'm giving it to you. You, you, you take that land. But one of the things that, that, that is true, and it's going to come back later on, is that uh, those people do have an opportunity um, to lay aside their idolatry and come back to uh, their original roots. Uh, they have that opportunity. Uh, some take it. Some take advantage of that opportunity, but, but many, many more do not. And, uh, and so they are punished and they are wiped out by the children of Israel. But later on, in, in a bigger way, as God is thinking about broadening this whole thing and the gospel going forward into all these nations, we need to consider the fact that we are all brothers and sisters and we serve one God and one God above us all. As Paul points out very eloquently in Acts chapter 17, one God and, and from one blood, God made all the nations of the earth. And that's a great way for us to go into the world and impact the world for the gospel of Christ, knowing that the people we're meeting and interacting with, they're, they're just like us and, and uh, their backgrounds and cultures and languages and all that are different, but uh, they have souls and they need to be saved. Dave, you were gonna say something else? Yes, very, very good observation, very good. Could it be, could I just make this suggestion that it took years, um, I'm, we don't know how many, but I know that from the time that the Lord says he's going to destroy the earth with the flood, he says, I'm gonna be patient for 120 years. And some amount of time during that, I don't know if it was the whole 120 years, but at some point, Noah's building the ark. Okay, and, and he's also a preacher of righteousness, uh, 1 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 2, 5, 1 Peter 2, 5. And there's an opportunity there 
for men and women to kind of open their eyes and say, what's happening? What's, what's, what's going on here? And um, so there was an opportunity there for people to be saved, just like Jericho. All these opportunities. Jonah going to Nineveh and preaching against it and those people repenting. The fact that they repented is a black mark on those who don't repent of their sins and a black mark against those today who do not repent and, and come to God. Why do you think that, why do you think it's been 2000 years since Jesus was here? What do you think God, what do you think God's doing? What's he up to? Right. Being patient and long suffering. All right. We're not going to be able to, when we get to the judgment, we're not going to be able to say, well, God, you just didn't give me the opportunity. You didn't give me enough time. You know, no, no, that's not, that's not going to be an excuse that works. Anyway, these people will be given the opportunity to repent and turn. And some of them will. Rahab the harlot is one example of that. All right. Questions, comments, any more? All right. I'm not going to take the time. I, I could go for a couple more minutes, but chapter 11, we'll uh, hit that next week, Lord willing. Thank you all for being here and being a part of our class this morning.